you would, open to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 will be here in just a moment. We are continuing in a series of lessons that we began last week on rock-solid faith. And this one is about the fact that science supports creation. In the book, The Scientific Case for the Existence of God, it states that there are three possible explanations for the existence of the universe. Either it's eternal, it's self-created, or there is a creator behind it. If the universe is eternal, of course that means it has always existed. And also that means that there is no meaning and there is no purpose for the existence of the universe. That it just is. It is just here. And with that concept in mind, it means that we are able to escape any responsibility and any accountability because we just are. We are just here as a part of this eternal universe. The second one, the idea of being a self-created universe, that is, it created itself out of nothing, again, you get the point of it is meaningless and it is purposeless. It is here by accident. It just happened. Somehow, some way, just poof, it came into existence. Again, that concept allows us to escape any responsibility or any accountability, and we can live however we want to live. The third possibility is the idea that the universe was created by someone, by something, if you will. And with that in mind, the universe has meaning. It has purpose. That there is a reason that has been brought into being and that it is heading toward an end. It is going somewhere for some reason. And this means we have responsibility and we have accountability. So you can see how the first two possibilities of it being eternal and it being self-created appeals to some people because if that's the case, they can do whatever they want to do in their life. Whereas the latter possibility, the third one, of there's a creator coming with responsibility and accountability, people want to avoid that sometimes. And what we want to do is study the Word of God and see what does the Word of God have to say about the existence of the universe. And we want to begin just simply by looking at this idea in Psalm 19 that the universe itself speaks to the existence of God. So Psalm 19 verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So the psalmist says, you look up into the universe and you will see the handiwork of God. You'll see it like an architect or a builder who has designed and built a building. You'll see that handiwork. You'll see the magnificence of that individual. you see the intelligence. you see the creativity. In the book of Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul echoes this sentiment when he's talking about the fact that the universe screams that God exists. In Romans 1 verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
So when we observe this universe, when we look at the sun and the moon and the stars, when we see the world around us, there is no excuse for us to say there is no God. Because it is overwhelmingly and abundantly evident that there is a God. There is a Creator. There is someone who has put these things in place that there is no way it could simply be by accident. The universe itself declares the existence of God. In this lesson on rock-solid faith, we want to notice two particular points. First of all, that the Bible declares the universe was created. And secondly, that scientific evidence, true science, supports the idea of creation and points to creation. The first thing we want to notice when we think about the Bible declares the universe was created is it tells us that God made all these things. The universe declares the existence of God and that God created this world. If you could look at Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1, though, we won't read the entire chapter, but just let's, let's notice a few verses as we go through here. Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So it's very interesting that the Bible really never sets out to prove the existence of God. The Bible approaches that issue just simply declaring God. In the beginning, God. He's there. It's a given fact that God exists. And it says that He created the heavens and the earth, the material universe that is around us. In verse 3, it says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. In verse 6, it talks about Him creating the atmosphere. Verses 9 through 12, it talks about God creating the seas and the dry lands and the plants. In verses 14 to 16, read this with me. Genesis 1 verse 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars. So God created the galaxies and the solar systems and the planets, all the stars that are out there, God made those things and put them in place. Verses 20 and 21 tells us that He made fish and He made birds, flying animals. Then it talks about in verse 24 and 25 that He made the animals, the beasts of the earth, the things that creep upon the face of the earth, the cattle and all those things. In verses 26 and 27, it tells us about the crowning achievement of God's creation, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made all these things. Now, I don't know if you caught it in the few verses we read, but in each one of these things, it says, Then God said, it's very specific to attribute this creative activity, this power, this miracle that is taking place to God, to the Almighty, because, of course, He is the Creator. We also want to understand the Bible declares that the universe was created in six days. Six 24-hour days of night, of darkness, and of day, of light. In Genesis 1.31 it says, Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So everything from the heavens and the earth and the light at the beginning on day one down through man happened within a six-day period. In Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 20, verse 11, when God is speaking from Sinai to the children of Israel and He's talking about keeping the Sabbath, he explains part of what's behind that command to keep the Sabbath in Exodus 20 verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. And that's why he is telling them to rest on the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. 
He repeats that same thing over in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17 when he's reminding Moses and the children of Israel about the covenant that he has made. And he says in Exodus 31, 17, it is a sign between you, uh, between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. In six days. It's repeated. It's almost as though the Holy Spirit is specifically nailing down the fact that all things, in this universe were created within a six day period. If you go to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, we have a record of the Lord as He, in the context, is talking about marriage. And He says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. From the beginning of creation. Now those who would espouse this idea that creation took place over millions of years, that statement by the Lord does not make sense. If He made male and female at the beginning of creation, we get it if it's within a six day period. But if it's within millions of years, what the Lord said here does not make any sense. So the Bible declares to us that the heavens, the earth, all things in them were made within six days. The Bible declares that the universe was indeed created. But on the other side of this, you have atheists who say that there's another explanation or maybe no explanation at all as to why the universe exists. And I'm going to read some quotes here from various sources and I apologize for the fact that we have to read through these things, but this is their view of the universe and why it is here. This quote comes from the Georgia State University website as it quotes Bertrand Russell, a famous atheistic philosopher. And this is what he said, and listen carefully to this, that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul salvation henceforth be safely built. I don't know about you, but if somebody comes to me and says, look, the only way your soul is going to be delivered from the guilt, the torment, the difficulty, the struggle that you face is on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, I wouldn't listen to another thing they ever said. You see how dark and gloomy that is? But that's because he doesn't believe in God. That's because he doesn't believe there's anything beyond the grave. That's because he believes all that is is what you see and hear now. And you're dead and you're gone. There's another quote we have from Dr. Robert Jastro. It's quoted in the case for the existence of God. And he said, only as a result of the most recent discoveries can we say with fair degree of confidence that the world has not existed forever, that it began abruptly without apparent cause in a blinding event that defies scientific explanation. Now that last part I agree with. It defines scientific explanation because it's a miracle. That's the definition of a miracle. You cannot test that by scientific means. But he believes that it began abruptly and without apparent cause. 
You know, the cause is staring them in the face. The cause is right there. If they will just humble themselves and accept it. But that is his explanation. The idea, of course, is that life is the result of evolution. That the universe is billions of years old and that they accept those things as scientific facts. But remember, when they talk about evolution, it's the theory of evolution. Not the fact of evolution, not the law of evolution. No honest scientist will ever say that. But it's the theory of evolution. The reason it's a theory, because they can't connect the dots. They can't prove it, they can't test it. It cannot be done. So it's a theory of evolution. And what we want to see is that true science supports creation and what the Bible tells us about the creation of the universe. One of the things that proves it is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, there's a big long definition I have written down here. I'm not going to read that entire definition, but it, part of it is natural entropic dissolution. Okay. Well, that means that everything falls apart. Right? Everything in the universe is heading toward decay. That the universe is going from an optimal state of existence of great efficiency to that which is falling apart, decaying, rotting, corrupting, it's disintegrating. Material things are not eternal. It's going to a chaotic state instead of an organized state. Now that notice what it says there. The second law of thermodynamics. That means they have proved this out through scientific investigation, testing, experimentation. It proves this is a fixed law. Things are breaking down. And we can see that. We can see that in the universe around us. We can see that in our world and in our lives. Evolution says everything's advancing. It's improving, right? Because think about what evolution says. It says there was a single little blob of cells out there that multiplied and became, I don't know, a fish, whatever, you know, along the way. And the fish became the frog and the frog became this and, and this became that. And you get the monkey, then you get the person. Right? So they're saying it's improving. It's getting more intelligent, more efficient. It's getting better. Well, the second law of thermodynamics completely contradicts that. Everything is breaking down. Everything is running out, if you will. And the Psalms back this up. Think about this. David wrote the Psalms, and the Psalms were recorded about a thousand years before Christ came into the world. So about 3,000 years ago, this is what the psalmist said. In Psalm 102, verse 25 and 26. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. Now overall, it's saying that what we see in the material universe, that's coming to an end. But key in specifically on they all grow old like a garment. Right? That's the second law of thermodynamics. You and I, we all have garments that have grown old over time. That they've ended up tearing, wearing out, fraying, falling apart. And we put those away and we replace them. And he's saying that this universe is growing old like a garment. It's decaying. It's falling apart. And one day it's all going to be done away with. And there will be that new heavens and new earth that the New Testament talks about. But the Bible acknowledged in David's day this idea of everything is decaying, everything is falling apart. That science supports exactly what the Word of God says. Also, we want to think about the fine-tuning of the universe. And this comes from the case for the Creator uh, Robert Collins, uh, Dr. Robert Collins, talks about this in that book about how gravity is fine-tuned. So imagine, if you will, a ruler that is as wide as the universe. Okay, The universe, I had to look this up, the known universe, because it keeps getting bigger. The further out that we see, it keeps getting bigger. 
but the known universe is 93 billion light years across. So if we could travel at the speed of light, it would take us 93 billion years to go from one end of the known universe to the other. Now my suspicion is that it's way bigger than that. And no matter how long this world exists and how far out man can see, it's just going to keep going. But be that as it may, 93 billion. So if you took a, a ruler and stretched it across the universe, and for every segment, for every degree, you had an inch that represented a degree of gravity. So think about all those inches across there. And, and I calculated this up. Inches in a mile is over 63,000. Hey, that's just one mile. So I can't even, I'm, I wouldn't even attempt to figure out how many would be in that universe, but it, it's just insanely large, right? So each increment of an inch represents a degree of gravity. If you changed it by one inch over that vast scale by one inch, life could not exist. And that's speaking to the fact that the universe is finely tuned in. It is exactly what it needs to be. Built and put together and efficient as God created it to be. If you go to the book of Job, book of Job chapter 38 verse 31, as God is rebuking Job and really humbling Job, basically saying, Job, who are you? Really, just who are you, Job? In Job 38, verse 31, he asked him this question, Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? So can, can you bring those stars together or you can, can you separate them? You, you don't have that power. God does with gravity. That's how He's done it. That's how He holds them together. That's why we can look up in the sky night after night, year after year, decade after decade. Centuries later, we can read about what ancient man saw in the sky. We see the same thing in the sky because gravity is there. And God tuned that in. He dialed that in. So there's persistence. There's consistency that is there. And He's telling Job, Job, you have no power over that at all. But God has that power and brought gravity into existence that keeps the stars in their place, on their path, if you will. There's also the law of biogenesis, and this comes out of the scientific case for creation. And the law of biogenesis is simply this. Life only comes from preceding life of its own type or kind. So many of us in school, somewhere along the way, studied or learned about Louis Pasteur. He's the guy that did the experiments and figured out that, you know, flies don't just magically appear on meat, that there's the larva and all that kind of stuff. I won't get into all of it. But life does not come from non-life. It's impossible. Life comes from life. And in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, the Bible stated this at the very beginning. In Genesis 1, verse 11, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields the seed according to its kind, the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So we understand that if we go out into a field and let's just say there is a watermelon vine there, we know there was a watermelon seed at some point put into that dirt. It didn't just magically appear there. Life comes from life. And so that's the law of biogenesis. It supports creation. And you think about this when people say, these atheists say, well, the universe just happened to pop into existence. From what? What was there? Well, life just happened to appear on planet Earth. Well, the law of biogenesis says that's impossible. It cannot happen. Now, this next one we want to look at is called irreducibly complex systems. 
And this comes from the case for the Creator. So what this has to do with is a device or a system has all the elements, but only those elements that allow it to function. And the illustration is given of a mouse trap. Okay? If you take any piece of the mouse trap out, it does not work. So not sure how well you can see that, but you know at the front there you got that little thing that you put the cheese on or peanut butter or whatever it is that attracts the mouse. You take that out, that little trigger, it's not going to work. Or that you know, square piece of wire that comes around and pops the mouse when it trips the trigger, you take that out, it doesn't work. You take out the little pin that holds that back or the spring. You take anything out here and it doesn't function, it doesn't work. So that's the idea of irreducibly complex device. It has different parts. You can't take anything away. You know, your automobile is not an irreducibly complex system. You can take out the windows, you can take out the sheet metal, take the sheet metal off, take the hood off. A lot of other things you can do that you can take off that automobile, it'll still function, it'll still run, it'll still go down the highway. Take the air conditioner out, the heater out, all those kinds of things, right? This is saying there's nothing you can take out and it's still functioning. Here's the point of it. When you look at a cell, and it has what's called cilia, that they are the hair-like surfaces on a cell that either allow that cell to move along or move stuff over the surface of that cell. And I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know all the things that are involved here. I just know what I read about. But here's the thing. These cilia are made up of three parts. And each of them are required for that cilia to work. They're made up of rods, of linkers, and motors. You take any one of them out, the cell will not function. It does not work. The cilia don't function. The cell's not going to function. It's not going to work. Now, it was given an illustration saying that there are 10,000 proteins in a cell and you need three of those to come together in the right way at the right place. So it's like this. If you had 10,000 people at a county fair, they're all blindfolded and they cannot speak to each other. And you're one of those people. You're blindfolded, you can't speak 10,000. You're all holding hands. Okay? You have to let go of those hands and you have to find two other people and grab their hands. The exact people, the right people. Not just any two, but the right two. And you have to grab their hands. So in the case of the cilia, let's say that you are a motor and you have to find a rod and a linker. Right? But you can only let go and grasp another hand one time a year. How long would it take you to hook up with the right two people? And you and I know that the odds are so great, basically never. That's never going to happen. What it's saying is that a creator had to put that cell together. There's no way these three essential parts could have come together in that cell. There's no way that someone had to assemble it because it never would have functioned. It had two pieces, it never would have functioned. It wouldn't have hung around, it wouldn't have been there for a million years to wait on that third piece to show up, right? All three of them had to be there together at the exact right time. So that's the idea of irreducibly complex systems and as we think about the cells the cells that go into the human body that make up the human body all the different cells and all their different functions and the complexity that goes far beyond just one little bitty cell think about what the psalmist said regarding himself in Psalm 139 verse 13 for you form my inward parts you cover me in my mother's womb I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. The last thing we want to notice is the law of cause and effect. 
And that simply is the idea that there must be some cause that is greater than and superior to the universe itself that brought the universe into existence. Again, I'm going to quote from Dr. Robert Jastrow. He's a atheist quoted in the scientific case for creation and he says this, the latest astronomical results indicate that at some point in the past the chain of cause and effect terminated abruptly. So an atheist looks and says, okay we follow and we trace the universe back and all these different things that we're looking at and cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect and boom, it just stops all of a sudden. An important event occurred the origin of the world for which there is no known cause or explanation. Now there is a known cause and explanation. He's just not accepting it. This law of cause and effect is why we come out of a store and we don't expect an elephant in our car. Right? There's, it's just not going to happen. Right? Unless circus elephant got loose and we understand came down the road and got up on the car. Okay. Don't argue with me. That we, we just, it just doesn't happen. You don't wake up and a giraffe's in your living room. It just doesn't happen, right? There's, there's a cause for the effect. Well, the greatest cause, or the greatest effect, I should say, is the universe. It exists. It's here. It's operating. It's functioning. We see it. We observe it. We know it. Well, what's the cause behind that effect? Well, the cause behind the effect is Almighty God. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. God brought the universe into existence. Men understand and accept the law of cause and effect. It's the law the scientific, verifiable fact of cause and effect. You see, science supports creation. Creation by the hand of an almighty, all-powerful God. Out of the three explanations of the universe and the reason it exists, either it's eternal, self-created, or there's a creator, science only supports one of those that there is a creator of the heavens and the earth. And the word of God from that creator says that as men live in this universe, they are without excuse. They must accept the reality of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. If you will, open to number 296. 296. So have you accepted the reality of a creator? If you follow the science that's been popularized this past year, you follow the science, you have to believe that there is a God. That God is revealed in the Bible. His will is expressed to us in His Word. It tells us that He loves us. Even though we have rebelled against Him, we have sinned against Him, we have separated ourselves from Him by following our own selfish desires. And it tells us that He had a plan to remedy that. He had a plan to redeem us from our sins, to have those sins forgiven through His Son. It tells us He sent His Son to die on the cross. That after He was put into that grave, that Christ was resurrected from the dead, proving that He is indeed the Son of God. And that we now must accept that evidence, believing Jesus is the Christ, repenting of our sins, being baptized to have our sins washed away, so that we might be redeemed and have the hope of everlasting life. If you accept that evidence, you accept that truth, then won't you come and confess Jesus as the Christ and be baptized to have your sins washed away? And if you're a child of God and you have wavered in your conviction about the Creator, 
Or you've wavered in your conviction and devotion to the Redeemer. Then won't you repent of that this morning? If there's something you need to confess publicly, we invite you to do that. We'll pray with you, we'll pray for you, and God will forgive you. If you need to respond, come forward while we stand and sing.